Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Shafali. I'm one of the clinical oncology registrars working in St. James's Hospital. And today we're going to talk about one of the big four cancers, that is prostate cancer. So the learning outcomes from today are to be able to explain the risks and benefits of PSA testing. We're also, be, uh, we're also going to be going through a map that takes you from the patient pathway all the way from screening to investigation to treatment. We'll also look at a, in a bit more detail the different treatment options for localized prostate cancer and we'll familiarize ourselves with basic images of things like robotic prostate surgery and external beam radiotherapy and in the end we'll briefly touch upon metastatic prostate cancer. So to start with prostate cancer is very common. The lifetime risk of a male in the UK developing prostate cancer is one in eight. There are different risk factors that can increase the risks of developing prostate cancer, such as age, family history, and ethnicity. Men over the age of 50 are much more likely to develop prostate cancer. If you have a family history of a first degree relative with prostate cancer, that increases your risk by two and a half times. And lastly, ethnicity. Being of Afro-Caribbean descent has shown to increase the risk of prostate cancer as well. We'll now talk about a few of the ways that patients can present. This can be after PSA screening. Now it's important uh, to understand this, that PSA screening is not a routine screening for cancer offered as part of the NHS. And this is because we haven't really been able to show that the risks of um, benefit outweigh the risks of harm. However, men over the age of 50 can go to their GP and request a PSA test after having an informed discussion about this. So this might be a way that prostate cancer is detected in otherwise asymptomatic men. Alternatively, patients can present with urinary symptoms such as straining or reduced flow or nocturia. These are often due to benign prostatic hypertrophy, but the subsequent investigations can sometimes um, help identify prostate cancer. And lastly, patients can also present in later metastatic stages with generalized fatigue, anemia, or bone pain, which can be um, a marker suggestive of bone metastases, which are common in prostate cancer. So we're going to talk a little bit more about PSA screening now. Now, this diagram quite beautifully explains the concept of overdiagnosis and has essentially been taken from a Canadian paper that trace the incidence and the mortality or the cancer-specific mortality of prostate cancer from 1969 to 2009, so over four decades. So as you can see, the dark blue dotted line represents the incidence of prostate cancer, whereas the light green dotted line represents the mortality. Over the last four decades, the incidence has been gradually increasing and had a significant spike around the time PSA tests were introduced. Over the same time period, the mortality due to prostate cancer has been gradually decreasing. Now, these diverging graphs essentially cannot be fully explained by the benefits brought on by screening or by improved treatments. And further analysis of the data shows that this is actually representative of overdiagnosis. Now, overdiagnosis essentially means that PSA tests are helping identify men with prostate cancer who during their entire lifetime would have never had any symptoms due to prostate cancer and would have never needed any treatment. So this diagnosis only leads to anxiety. In fact, uh, there have been various studies to try and identify the extent of overdiagnosis due to PSA screening. And that has ranged from, uh, depending on how it's calculated and which population, from estimates from about 20 2% all the way to 67% of overdiagnosis due to PSA screening. So we'll try to understand a few more of the concepts of the patient pathway by following a clinical case of Mr. AB. Mr. AB is a generally fit and well man. He's 60 years old and has recently started a new relationship. His partner is well aware of the risks of prostate cancer due to her own family history. And after discussion, Mr. AB has decided to come to his GP and request a PSA test. 
he's otherwise completely asymptomatic and fine. What would you advise here? So we're now going to go through a really important pathway or a map illustrating the risks and benefits of PSA screening. So let's start with the GP surgery where 100 asymptomatic fit and well men are screened for prostate cancer with a PSA test. Now, a few really important things are that it's very normal to have some PSA in the blood. It's normally produced by the prostate gland. However, there's a cutoff around 3 nanograms per mil above which um, we investigate for possible pathology. However, PSA is not specific to prostate cancer. It can be raised in a variety of other conditions, including benign enlargement and infection. So out of these 100 patients, it's quite likely that 83% or 83 out of 100 will have a normal PSA test, whereas 17 patients are going to have an abnormal PSA test. Out of the patients who have a normal PSA test, 15% of these will be a falsely reassuring normal, that is a false negative. These patients might actually have prostate cancer, but the PSA returns normal. Now let's look at the 17 patients with an abnormal test in a bit more detail. It's quite likely that the GP will refer them on the two-week wait pathway to secondary care urology services. At the urology clinic, they're likely to have a history, an exam, and a digital rectal examination. At this point, if felt prudent, the urologists are likely to refer the patient for an MRI scan of the prostate of the prostate if there is suspicion of prostate cancer. Most patients who have an MRI scan, so more than 80% of them, go on to then have a biopsy. What the MRI does is helps target the biopsy and helps identify the re regions that look abnormal. The biopsy is usually done by interventional radiology and can either be transrectal or transperineal. We'll talk about this in a bit more detail, but a biopsy is not without risks. Finally, all this information is brought back to the MDT. The results of the PSA test, the results of the biopsy, and the results of the MRI scan. And on the basis of these results, a decision is made whether these are indicative of prostate cancer or actually just a benign pathology. It is important to note that the, at the end of this entire pathway, 75% of patients who went through this pathway will not have prostate cancer. So 75% of those 17 patients will have gone through multiple investigations only to be told that they're all negative. So let's come back to Mr. AB. He has a detailed discussion with his GP where the risks and benefits are explained to him and the limitations of the PSA test are explained to him. He then decides that he wants to go on to have a PSA test and this turn returns back is elevated as 14 nanograms per mil. He's then quite rightly referred on by the two-week wait pathway to urology, where he has a full examination, including a DRE, and is referred for a pre-biopsy MRI and a transrectal ultrasound, like we've just seen. This image here essentially shows a coronal section of an MRI pro uh, scan of the prostate. As you can see, the prostate is a gland that sits just below the urinary bladder and essentially produces prostatic fluid, which is a component of semen. Truss biopsy is a transrectal ultrasound-guided biopsy. This is usually done as an outpatient under interventional radiology. Now, a truss biopsy is associated with risks. This can include rectal discomfort, blood in the urine or semen for a few days, but most worryingly, it can also be associated with the risk of sepsis. Now, there's a 3% chance of sepsis and hospitalization due to this procedure and comes with small risk of death. Just as a note, transperineal biopsies tend to be safer as far as the risk of sepsis is concerned. Traditionally, 
These were avoided as this was done under general anesthesia, but more recently we've been able to perform these under local anesthesia as well, and so they're becoming more favoured and commonplace. Now let's go through a mind map essentially of what happens once a patient is diagnosed with prostate cancer, like our Mr. Raby. If there is evidence of metastatic prostate cancer, then the patient goes on to have systemic treatments. On the other hand, the prostate cancer may be found to be simply localized. In this case, the prostate cancer is then graded according to risk. This risk essentially is the risk of recurrence and the risk of metastases. This grading depends on three main factors, the TNM stage, the Gleason score, and the PSA value. Some patients will be classified on this basis as low risk. These patients are then offered usually one of three treatments, active surveillance, surgery, or radiotherapy. Other patients might be classified as intermediate risk or high risk. These patients usually go on to have a bone scan just to check for any metastases. They then go on to be offered treatment, which is usually either surgery or radiotherapy. Now, the radiotherapy itself can be external beam radiotherapy or EBRT or internal radiotherapy with the help of radioactive seeds or radioactive sources, which is called brachytherapy. Now, just to touch upon this, surgery and radiotherapy are both radical treatment options. Active surveillance, on the other hand, is a monitoring program where these patients are kept under close monitoring by the team in order to defer any potential radical treatment and to avoid the consequent side effects that come with it as for as long as possible. This can include three to four monthly PSA tests, annual DREs and regular checkups with the urology clinic. We're now going to look into a little bit of detail on the different risk factors that affect grading of prostate cancer. We'll start with the Gleason score, which is essentially a histopathological score that's given to the prostatic biopsy. The tissue that is taken from biopsy is studied under a microscope and the tissue architecture is studied. The most common abnormal tissue architecture is graded from one to five, with five being the most abnormal and distorted, and is given a number. And the second most common abnormal tissue architecture is also identified and given a number. And the sum of these forms the Gleason score. So for example, a four plus three Gleason score means the most common prostatic abnormal tissue looked like a Gleason four, and the second most common was looked like a Gleason three, which adds up to a Gleason seven. Importantly, uh, the Gleason score is more increasingly being replaced by the ISEP score, which is the International Society of um, Urological Pathology, which simplifies this a little bit and grades it from one to five. In terms of staging of the prostate cancer, the MRI scan and the digital rectal exam help identify this. So T1 prostate cancers are those cancers that cannot be felt on the DRE, but are simply found on biopsy. T2 cancers are those that are still limited to within the prostate gland. T3 cancers are cancers that have extended beyond the prostate capsule, whereas T4 cancers are those um, invading into other local structures like the rectum or the bladder. We'll also talk about um, the end stages about nodes, so N0 is no nodes and N1 is presence of nodes and similarly the M is metastases with M0 is no METs and M1 is presence of METs. On the basis of this information that we now have, the PSA, the TNM scoring system, and as well as the Gleason score, we can now classify patients into the three categories that we talked about. So low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. So we'll talk a little bit more about low risk patients first. The PROTECT study, was a large randomized UK study done from 1999 to 2009 for more than 1,600 prostate cancer patients. All of these had localized prostate cancer and about 75 of these are what we would classify as low risk. These patients were then 
randomized into one of three trial arms, which was either active monitoring or active surveillance, radical radiotherapy or radical surgery. And there were more than 500 patients in each arm, so quite equally distributed. The most important outcome of the PROTECT study was that in terms of mortality or overall survival, there was no difference at all between the three arms. All men lived equally long. However, in the active monitoring arm, it was noticed that many patients ultimately, over the years, do end up having radical treatment. So they're under active monitoring and monitored closely with um, examinations and PSA. And when these start to rise, they're then advised to go on to have either radical surgery or radiotherapy. And by 10 years, more than half of these patients will have had some radical treatment. They also did note that more metastatic cancer develops in the active monitoring arm than in the radical surgery or radical radiotherapy arm. And having radical treatment up front decreases the risk of developing metastatic cancer by 50%. It's important to understand that older patients with a more limited expected lifespan or those with comorbidity might be even less likely to benefit from any sort of upfront radical treatment. Now coming back to Mr. AB, so we know his PSA was 14 nanograms per mil. He had the MRI which showed a T2N0 M0 prostate cancer. And on the basis of his Gleason score, it was identified as 4 plus 3. So all of these together put him in the intermediate risk category. He was then advised one of three options, surgery, radiotherapy, or uh, well, external beam radiotherapy, or brachytherapy. As he was quite fit, well and young, active monitoring was not advised in this particular situation. These pictures here just are an example of how prostatic radical surgery is done nowadays. This is often done through robotic surgery. As you can see, the surgeon, the main, the lead surgeon is actually away from the patient, is not scrubbed in, but is sitting at the robotic console and uh, manipulating the different arms. The patient that you can see on the bed here is in a low Trendelenburg position, with the head towards the inferior end of the slide. And you can see that the robotic arms are over his abdomen, which is the exposed area. This image is an image of external beam radiotherapy. Uh, the image on the far right is an example of a linear accelerator, which is used to deliver the external beam radiotherapy. And you can also see the radiotherapy plan that aims to target most of the radiation to the area around the prostate gland. And this is given in an arc-like manner through a technique we called VMAT. And this last image is an image of brachytherapy. Uh, as you can see, this patient is under general anesthetic and is in a lithotomy position. And transperineally, several needles have been inserted into his prostate gland. The other picture shows uh, an image of what we call an afterloader that has radioactive sources in it. And that radioactive source is then controlled remotely via all the cables that you can see that attach to the needle. And that radioactive source goes through those cables and deposits radiation locally in the prostate gland at different points for a given period of time. This is an example of high dose rate brachytherapy. It provides improved radiation doses to local areas and can improve cancer control locally. This is the example of the radiotherapy plan in high dose rate brachytherapy prostate. And you can see that the different hot spots that are red in the center are essentially areas where the needles have been inserted that mark where the seeds should travel for a given period of time. In summary, surgery is a good option for patients who are young, under the age of 70 years old, and fit and well for general anesthetic. The main long-term complications are urinary and with impotence or sexual dysfunction. External beam radiotherapy is quite a good option for patients who might be older and have um, multiple comorbidities 
as it's a non-invasive option and simply involves lying flat on the couch of a linear accelerator. However, the long-term side effects include um, bowel problems and, in, and can include faecal incontinence. And brachytherapy also requires patients uh, to be fit and well, as it's done under general anaesthetic. It is an invasive procedure delivering local radiotherapy. And the main side effects tend to be urinary, so it's avoided in patients with large prostates. In terms of metastatic prostate cancer, these patients usually present with fatigue and bone pain. Prostatic cancer tends to initially spread to the bone and cause widespread bone metastases. As you can see, the picture in the top is a picture of a technetium bone scan, and the areas that are quite densely black illustrate the areas of suspected bone metastases. This can be correlated by the image on the bottom, which is a plain x-ray or a plain skyogram, showing sclerotic bony mets. Androgen deprivation therapy is commonly the main form of treatment, which has continued lifelong for these patients. Other systemic drugs can also be considered in, in fitter patients, such as chemotherapy and abiraterone and enzalutamide. Uh, Bone metastases can also cause significant pain, so palliative localised radiotherapy is also another option for better symptom control. Very briefly, ADT or androgen deprivation therapy is essentially based on the principle that prostatic cells require testosterone to divide and similarly prostatic cancer requires testosterone to grow. Now, testosterone is produced both, uh, or androgens are produced both by the adrenal gland and the testes. So, antiandrogens block at that level, whereas other drugs such as uh, GnRH agonists or antagonists block the pathway more superiorly at the level of the pituitary hypothalamus feedback loops with the testes and adrenal glands. The aim of ADT is essentially to drop the testosterone levels or to medically castrate. This is a very interesting picture of two uh, identical, well, of a pair of identical twins that you can see. Now, Mr. B had, was diagnosed with prostate cancer and started ADT one year ago. Both of these looked, uh, men looked exactly similar and had pretty healthy lifestyles. But after one year of ADT, you can see that they look very, very different. So ADT can cause quite significant side effects, including hot flushes, weight gain, an increased risk of metabolic syndrome or developing hyperlipidemia, diabetes, can cause osteoporosis and increased risk of bone fractures. And people can also develop mood changes or irritability due to this. Some observational and retrospective studies have suggested that there is up to a 5% increased absolute risk of mortality due to ADT in patients who are known to have a history of cardiovascular disease. That is one extra death for every 20 patients. However, this has not been confirmed in studies of randomized control trials and other observational or retrospective studies have found a much smaller effect size. Nevertheless, it's important to be careful and prudent when recommending ADT, as it does have significant side effects. In conclusion, prostate cancer is a very common cancer and the incidence is certainly rising. The proportion of men with low risk or low intermediate risk prostate cancer can potentially be managed just with active monitoring and do not need invasive treatments. In terms of radical local treatment, surgery or radiotherapy plus minus ADT is the mainstay of radical treatment. Increasingly, there are more and more systemic agents being used for metastatic prostate cancer. And lastly, the management of patients dying with metastatic prostate cancer can be quite tricky. And it's very important to involve the palliative care team and ensure good symptom control for good quality of life. Thank you.